I'm talking to Paul Van Gelder, who's the CEO, Chief Executive Officer at Mammut, which is by far the world's largest heavy lifting and transport specialist. Thank you for talking to me today, Paul. You're welcome. Pleasure. Uh, we're all aware of the impact of the coronavirus COVID-19 on the world in general, but I'd like to talk about how it's affecting the industry um, of lifting and transport and how it's being dealt with what the future might look like. Paul, what's what's been the impact of the coronavirus COVID-19 on you and the business so far? I think, um, and, and that, that will be the case for the majority of all uh, heavy lifting transport companies, it has been um, quite a substantial impact. Um, and what we are going through is a three-stage process right now. Uh, immediately when the, the virus we saw the first breakouts in China. We already identified it and we started taking actions already in February. In February, we started questioning uh, whether all travel should be should continue, especially travel uh, to Asia, um, because we formulated our priorities very clearly and also communicated that in uh, into the company. So our priority has always been the safety and health of our, uh, our employees and business continuity as the second priority. So from that as a starting point, in February, we started looking at travel, um, started defining non-essential travel, um, putting in restrictions, but also immediately following the guidelines of all the countries that we operate in. We increased the communication with our regional management teams. As a board, we started uh, having daily board meetings. Every morning, 8.30, we would call in wherever people were, uh, and most of the time that was just working from home, of course, just to go through all the aspects of the world. So we implemented special reporting formats just to keep track of the people where our people were all over the world and keep track of travel restrictions and potential consequences. Um, we also started up a whole sequence of video messages by individual board members and even video messages in the regions by the regional managers or directors. So we did a lot. It had a substantial impact on the business in the sense that um, we couldn't have people traveling from one project to uh, another project. We couldn't ship equipment as easy as normal. But overall, uh, I'm extremely uh, proud to see that the organization was resilient and reacted, uh, I think, very well to the circumstances. So what are you doing about things like social distancing and um, those procedures that you need to have in place on sites? What we're doing is um, we adopted the one and a half meter or uh, in, in, in the US, I think it was six feet that they used um, as a life saving rule. So immediately the CQ organization adopted the uh, their, their policies and stated that for all our work, the, um, the six feet or the 1.5 meters should be adopted and kept, kept as a, a life-saving rule and used in the toolbox every mo morning. So worldwide, we were checking whether the toolbox meetings contained that element of keeping a social distance. What we also did is we reviewed all the, um, the project circumstances and that was difficult because a lot of the, the circumstances that our people have to work in are dictated by customers. So we engage with customers how we could keep that social distance, not only at the work site, but also in the cafeterias and in sleeping accommodations. We did a lot. Um, uh, and as, as the board, we continuously reviewed all the materials being published around the world, scientific reports, interviews, just to make sure that we were on top of it. How is it affecting the demand for equipment? in different regions of the world? Well, what we've seen is uh, we've not seen so many cancellations, but of course there were some delays, some uh, some postponements in the execution of projects. Um, that for us led to a, um, a week, uh, say week by week um, adjustments of schedules, uh, both from people, you know, uh, people transfers, but also equipment transfers. Overall, what we've seen is that, uh, and it depends on the region, we've seen some changes in the demand for equipment and, and uh, people. 
you could see the effect of having two large regions and three smaller ones in the larger regions of of course if you know if there's a, a drop of five percent or ten percent the effect in an absolute value is larger but what we could see is that the, di the, the diversification is paying off so a region like europe russia they serve many sectors many segments and they provide different services so a combination of for example master service agreements or maintenance work for plants with standard projects and very large to mega projects so that combination of, as, uh, of, of provided services made that region very robust now on the other hand we also had regions with limited number of projects like uh, latin america for example and then if uh, out of the six or seven projects, uh, three projects are stopped because of the, uh, the COVID-19 situation, of course, that, that hits you. That uh, results in a drop in demand for equipment. Looking ahead, what's coming next? Um, immediate future, perhaps a period of recovery? What, what sort of time scale are you looking at? Well, what I mentioned is that we've gone through a three-stage process, or we're not going, uh, we've, we haven't gone through it yet, but we've defined three stages. The first stage, we call this phase one, immediate response. That is the crisis management phase. And that was really the case starting as of February, because I think we were reacting very early in the, in the, in the, in the COVID situation already to the changing circumstances. So that phase one started in February, it is ongoing. Uh, some regions are already into phase two, some are still in phase one, um, and that is dealing with the immediate challenges of um, having to rotate shifts, shift and, and manage the shift rotations and also sending equipment from one place in the world to another place under travel restrictions and lockdowns. So dealing with that, making sure that the safety and health of our people are guaranteed and continuation of the business, that was all part of phase one. We expect that by July, that phase one for all regions will, you know, end. Everything is then uh, the, the crisis management situation is then moving into phase two, and that is how we're going to recover from uh, the COVID-19 situation. How we keep, uh, are we going to manage, you know, people returning back to the office, um, starting up projects again, um, in consultation and coordination with the customers. And also, um, you know, what, what, where is our equipment? Uh, what are the hotspots that we still see? And how can we really make sure that in a controlled manner, we start up the projects again um, in the best way possible to serve our customers? And then um, by the end of 2020, early 2021, we'll start with phase three. And that phase is really aimed at uh, making sure that we are well positioned, given the fact that we've then completed almost the integration with uh, the former ALE organization. So in that phase, phase three, we will position the company in such a way that we can serve our customers in a new reality, as we call it, being a reality with uh, potentially lower oil and gas prices, um, a, a demand and supply balance that is not supporting a lot of investments in petrochemical so um, that is more a strategic phase um, positioning mammoth for the future how much time left is there on existing projects do you think in the oil and gas industry what do you mean alex the, how much well, time? Um, i was looking at the uh, the big refinery in oman and that's 15 yeah. billion dollars and it's going to be over the next i think 15 years or something i mean presumably those sorts of things will continue but yeah. how often do you need new things to start to be keep it all rolling yeah well um in 2018 we developed a strategy called reshape to win and that mm -hmm. strategy was uh, based on three pillars uh, or three work streams, as we call them. The first one is retaining market leadership. So these were the activities that were all focused on, you know, the things that we're doing good, but that we need to have in place. For example, strong commercial excellence or a, um, uh, a very strong CQ performance, safety performance. The second pillar or work stream was all about what do we need to improve, for example, we thought that our working capital was too high. So that was a dedicated area where we wanted to see improvements. Our third 
pillar in the strategy was all around where can we grow and where can we uh, say build new businesses and what do we need to do to make the company more resilient. We're continuing with that because we feel that in the new low oil price, low gas price environment, um, the number of big projects will come down. That is a consequence that we're already seeing. I was looking at the RISTAT numbers uh, last week. Yesterday, we received the report of the International Energy Agency, the IEA. Um, you could see a drop of over 20% in FID in uh, this year alone. Being late cyclical, that will translate into um, a drop in project activities in 22-23. We've seen that already after the 2014-2016 slump um, in oil and gas prices, which also led to a you know, with a lagging effect of two to three years, a drop in activity levels. So you need to be prepared there and you need to change also um, the setup of the organization and also the focus of your commercial organization. We know that, for example, um, infrastructure, uh, civil, those kind of markets and renewable energy, for example, they will benefit from government um, uh, uh, investments as a response to this whole COVID-19 crisis. So this is where we are now uh, proactively looking at with our organization. Yeah, looking at refineries, um, nobody in the world knows how the oil and gas price will develop. Um, you know, it's 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 very hard to predict. So I'm reading reports of, uh, from McKinsey, Reistead, and a number of other uh, consultancy firms you know, did we already pass peak oil uh, or will peak oil now move from 2035 to 2028? It's it's very hard to predict. It depends on how fast will the economies, for example, in Asia recover? Um, how fast will we go to a more renewable energy approach in Europe, uh, led by the European Committee, uh, the Green Deal, for example? So there are many questions. I think what uh, the, the main three things from Mammut now are uh, resilience, flexibility, and efficiency. So our reshape to win strategy will move on to till 2025. We will make adjustments based on those three key words, making the organization more resilient, bringing in flexibility to withstand all the changes that are going to happen, and always drive for efficiency, because it will be a difficult market for a certain period. Okay. So people will always need energy, obviously, electricity, say, um, instead of making it from from oil. Um, if you're making it from wind energy, you obviously put the turbines up. What What's the, the crane input in terms of per gigawatt? Is it more for wind or more for oil and gas or how, how involved are the, the cranes in each? Well, let me first um, make it clear that we as Mammut, we we'd like to serve every customer regardless whether it's in oil and gas uh, or in renewable energy. For us, uh, a crane job is a crane job, but they do differ from each other. So you can see in oil and gas, um, you work with heavier cranes and these cranes uh, are less dynamic, so they're more stationed. Um, the, 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 the safety requirements, because sometimes you have to work in a live plant, um, so it, it's a different way of working there, for example, in the renewable energy, where you have uh, preferred cranes like the LG, LG 7050, a high reach, you know, uh, mobile crane that uh, uh, is much better equipped for renewable energy. So sometimes I have these conversations with customers that think that this, all these cranes are interchangeable. That's not the case. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. That is a strategic requirement that we have to fill in as, as Mammut. Um, do we have a preference? No. Um, but what we can see is that renewable energy is an immature market with a lot of challenges. If we're doing projects in oil and gas, um, the number of claims that we see, the discussions that we have with our customers are less, much less than in renewable energy. In renewable energy, we're working with tight margins, customers that uh, are being scrutinized by governments to work without subsidies. And that is translating into, uh, you know, a lot of requirements by customers, but also uh, sometimes tension on these projects. 
but we're growing in that. Uh, what is helping Mammut is that we have so many of the renewable energy projects around the world and we're learning so fast with our organization. We've established, established an, uh, a wind expert team this year. We've developed a wind strategy. Um, we've defined a number of these uh, OEMs in the wind, in the renewable energy uh, business as, as key accounts and also dealing with them on a key account management basis. So we're learning fast um, and that's positioning us well for the future. And similarly, another area of growth is um, the decommissioning of old uh, oil platforms and things. How much of that is affected by the oil price or driven by um, legislation or who will pay for that? I mean, will that continue? Will it grow or will the oil price mean it doesn't? Uh, we, we will see more decommissioning coming to, uh, to the market. Um, we're already seeing it in, uh, in the Netherlands. As you might know, we're part of the SHV group. SHV, uh, under SHV, there are seven companies. One of the companies is called uh, One Diaz. Uh, they are an uh, active player in oil and gas. So I'm on a regular contact with my uh, colleague CEO of One Diaz. And we see that uh, uh, with a low oil price, low gas price, some production is not <clears throat> profitable anymore. And these wells will be shut in and uh, decommissioning will be moved you know, um, forward. So we'll, we will see an increase of activities in, uh, in the North Sea. Um, companies will always be hesitant in decommissioning platforms because there's always the chance that oil prices will go up, gas prices will go up, and then they, these platforms, these production will be profitable again. But um, for our industry, uh, being uh, the, the company that also provides offshore services, Decommissioning is not a business that we're really focusing focusing on, um, because our contribution is is limited. We do the the load ins, um, you know, come, uh, platforms coming from a ship or a barge, and then uh, need to be moved to, uh, for example, a decommissioning or a salvage place um, where they are torn apart. But our contribution is limited, so it's it's more. The shipping companies, I think, the specialized companies for decommissioning that will benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, what advice would you give to other people in the industry and maybe smaller companies? What what should they be doing that you've learned that you could pass on some some tips? Make your organization robust. That is really really important. And um, I go, I you know, I grew up. Um, being a former naval officer, um, I've learned a lot of concepts that were important in those days. For example, uh, when I visited, attended university, I was brought up with just-in-time manufacturing, um, very low levels of uh, inventories just to drive down your working capital. These things will change um, simply because if something happens like COVID-19, you will see a disruption in in some supply chain. So you need to be quite self-sufficient in all aspects. And the same uh, it applies to um, the ability to get people to, to projects. So your dependency on a, um, a, a limited number of super specialists that come from one region or one country, and that is something you have to really review whether that is a situation that you want to continue with, or maybe you want to have these specialists in every region present so that you have to travel when you have re travel restrictions you will not be hit hard robustness is comes also with having a very strong strategy and sticking to your strategy i think that is really important um, and robustness also comes from your balance sheet so mammoth is in the lucky situation that we have a very strong shareholder the shv company uh, has an annual turnover of more than 20 billion they um, employ more than 60,000 people worldwide, um, and they give us a very strong financial backing. So if you're now um, heavily leveraged and uh, you're, you're depending on, uh, on, on bond financing, for example, this is not a great period. Um, and uh, the robustness of your balance sheet is a very strong, uh, I think, element that will drive the business forward and, uh, and, and keep you in a good position. Do you, do you see many um, crane and transport companies perhaps failing financially in the next few months? Obviously, there will be companies out there that uh, are highly leveraged and that will suffer. 
So if, uh, if, if you run a company with a limited number of uh, projects or customers and you're highly leveraged and you're in a, in a situation where you're hit by uh, work that has been stopped, for example, and then um, if, if you're not able to preserve your cash, you will run into issues and, uh, and some companies might, uh, might feel these effects. Whether we will see a massive um, movement of companies ending up in, uh, in bankruptcy, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that the smaller companies, a lot of the smaller family-owned companies, you know, they, they're not highly leveraged. Uh, they, um, they, they know how to preserve cash in a good way um, because that's the nature of family-owned businesses. By the way, SHV is also family-owned, so we're brought up with that thinking. Um, but it can happen. It can certainly happen. And we're already, uh, uh, you know, hearing some, some stories, especially in the US, of some companies having it very difficult. Looking further ahead, then, what um, permanent major disruptive changes do you see that will stay after the virus has run its course? Well, I, the fact that we're having this interview in in this setup from home, including myself, and still being able to have a good interview, um, that that is already proof of things that can change and and that will change. Yes. We are seeing um, uh, some developments that people want to go back to the office again, uh, especially if you're working, for example, on innovations. And we have a lot of people that are busy with innovations on the digital side and then with the focus crane. These teams want to have that collaboration uh, in, a, in a physical presence, um, still maintaining the 1.5 meters and, and all the other um, measures that have been put in place, like uh, you know, uh, high-level hygiene by hand washing and, and everything else, we will allow these teams to get back just to stimulate these creative processes. Uh, and some engineering departments also have that. But if you're working in HR, finance, management in general, legal, a lot of these support functions, these people can work from home. And uh, so the, the need for them to, to be five days per week in an office, um, that, that will change. And we will see that in every company. What we're seeing in the Netherlands is that the big law firms are basically having zero people in the office right now. Uh, everybody works from home. So that, you know, that, that will uh, bring down, I think, the uh, demand for uh, gasoline, for example, in some, uh, some countries, some regions. And obviously, that will have a, a long-term effect, structural effect on the demand and supply balance in oil and gas. Now, having said that, um, what we also see at the same time is that the, on the supply side in oil and gas, we also see movements very quickly responding to the market. So uh, we see uh, a drop in, uh, in shale oil, shale gas in the U.S. We see uh, production being shut in on the North Sea. So ultimately, that also will have an effect. But you can say, to summarize, um, the world in 2021 will be different than in 2019. We will see less uh, traffic on the road, so less road traffic. We will see less uh, flights, less aviation, um, smaller airline companies, um, uh, a stronger role of governments supporting or uh, investing in, in renewable energy, the things that I mentioned before, civil infrastructure. So the world will structurally change. And the companies that ultimately will be the most successful are the companies that, with a good strategy, are able to adjust, you know, maybe even cut or restructure and then uh, serve the market in the best way moving forward. What are you doing in your time in lockdown that's different from your usual usual life. anything that anything that's changed the way you you got more time to do this or that you know anything like that um yeah I'm, I'm, i don't know you know what your commuting uh, time is but uh, for me it's at least two hours 20 minutes a day wow. um so that means that in the in those periods i could always work a little bit i i, I would have calls Obviously, um, in, in our, with our safety policy in mind, we would always restrict those calls, but um, I could still do some work. Nowadays, um, since I don't have to commute anymore, um, I, I gain two hours. Um, but I also lose some efficiency because I'm in a lot in, in, in calls like this. So normally you walk around the, the office and you can address certain topics with people in a very you know quick manner. Uh, now I have to schedule a call or have a uh, write an email uh, so so 
you win some, uh, you lose some. From a personal, from a private perspective, I really enjoy uh, the fact that, you know, after six o'clock, 6.30, work is done. I can uh, put on my running shoes. And, and other than that, yeah, it's it's also nice to uh, sometimes to to go downstairs and, and meet your wife. Uh, that's a, yes. that's a strange experience, certainly in the first month. But uh, you know, normally a lot of people in heavy lifting and transport travel a lot, um, so it gives you also some more time with the family. Within SHV, there are uh, they have formulated a number of principles, and one of the principles is that you know uh, wherever you work. You need to be aware of the fact that you're part of a society and you need to contribute to a society wherever you do your job. So we're always stimulating to uh, to engage with the local communities and to uh, add value to uh, to society that you're operating. And the good thing is that we haven't changed that. So we continue to reach out to the societies that we uh, work in to see what we uh, where we can support them. And these are all very local initiatives um, and um, uh, on a yearly basis we hand out prices for the region and countries that have done their uh, their utmost to support um, the communities that they operate in operate in and for us you know um, what we aim to do is continue to serve our customers in the best way possible taking into consideration safety measures and i think for now that is the, the best we can do obviously um, there is need for medical equipment, uh, masks, uh, special safety uh, PPE that we're not uh, developing, that we're not, we can't supply. So uh, what we really wanted as a board was people to continue their work as much as possible, taking into consideration uh, the fact that they operate in in a society, but also um, we take care of the well-being of our employees when working from home uh, because. There's always the risk of, of more stress uh, for people that have smaller houses. So those were the, the priorities for uh, for Mammut. Um, I've got to the end of my questions. Yeah. What should I have asked you that I haven't done? <laughs> I always get that question. Okay. I can name many, many questions, you know. Um, no, one one of the things I mentioned it very briefly, but we are uh, we, we are in the process of integrating companies. And uh, a question that I get a lot is, how is the integration of ALE into Mammut? How is that uh, going forward? Um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased and proud to see that um, even despite the corona crisis, the integration with, uh, with ALE and Mammut is going very well. Um, people are, work together on all projects. We see equipment being used, uh, ALE equipment, Mammoth equipment being used in, in projects. The people out there in the field, they understand each other. It's great to see, you know, visiting these projects. Unfortunately, I can't do it as much as I like. And certainly the last two months, it wasn't possible. But um, I look at LinkedIn, um, people send me pictures and you can clearly see that people, you know, they, they found each other. In the offices, uh, of course, the, there was less interaction because of the COVID-19 crisis. But even there, we made huge steps uh, integrating ALE into uh, into Mammut, and we did it on a basis where we said, you know, it's not that Mammut has taken over ALE, and uh, but we try to uh, continue with, with the best of both worlds, and that has paid out uh, quite well. So. Um, I hope one day that I will be able to travel again to uh, to all, all the locations and meet with the former ALE people. But uh, I think that I won't even recognize them as the former ALE people anymore because they are all now part of Mammut and, and they are proud of it. Thanks, Paul.